I had a question um, on how this limiter is working. So I wanted to uh, talk about that. Um, so the question was, if there is a 5 volt DC source here in the circuit, how come my um, output voltage is not always going to be something uh, over 5 volts? And why do uh, why why is this uh, transfer characteristic the way it is, so that the output voltage can actually be less than five volts if the input is less than five volts, uh, or if the input voltage is negative. Okay, and the reason uh, that is so is because of where we're measuring the output voltages in this circuit. So let's take. Um, the simplest case, and let's say that uh, my input voltage is going to be zero. Okay, so I'll set this to zero. So that means that this point in my circuit, this node down here, um, let's let's call this ground. Okay, and what's the voltage now at this point? in my circuit. Yeah, this should be zero volts here. Um, so the voltage at, at this end of the diode is something around zero volts. Depends on what the voltage drop is across this resistor. And the voltage at this end of the diode is five volts. So the diode is under what bias condition? Probably reverse bias. Okay, so there's no current going through the diode. So there's that means that there's no current through the resistor either. Okay, so that means there's no voltage drop across the resistor. So this point in the circuit should also should also be zero volts. Okay, so. If I take my output from this point in the circuit, which is zero volts with respect to ground, which is also zero volts, then my output is zero volts when my input is zero volts. Okay, so that's this point in the circuit. So it's tracking along with uh, what this transfer characteristic is predicting. So let's pick another point. And let's say that my input voltage uh, is now going to be negative one volt. Okay, I'll leave this as ground. So that means this point in the circuit is negative one volt. What's the bias condition on the diode now? Still reversed biased. Um, because this side's at a higher potential than this side. So if you had current flowing, it would want to flow in this direction, opposite to the, the orientation of the diode. So this is reversed bias. In fact, it's more strongly in reverse bias, um, because now this side of the diode is at a, an even more of a negative potential. Okay, so the current is still going to be zero. And so this point in the circuit, the current through the resistor is still zero. So this point in the circuit is negative one volt. And I'm measuring now this voltage with respect to ground. So if my input uh, voltage was negative one volt, then my output voltage is also negative one volt. So that's that point in the circuit. And as I keep on making my my input voltage more and more negative, I'm just putting this diode into a stronger and stronger reverse bias. So I would end up tracing that curve. Okay, and then if I go forward, that's going back to that zero case that we had. Okay, let's try another point. So let's say I have an input voltage of 2.5 volts. 
Let me erase some of this stuff. Sorry. Okay. Um, so we're setting our input voltage. The two and a half volts. Okay, so that means this point in the circuit is two and a half volts, positive two and a half volts. What's the the bias condition on the diode going to be now? Still reverse bias, less reverse bias than when we had a negative input voltage. Um, but still, I'm going to have. If I was going to have current flowing, it would be flowing uh, from the five volt source towards the input, which is opposite to the direction of the diode. Okay, so I still have a reverse bias diode. The current through this resistor is still going to be zero. So this point in the circuit is also two and a half volts. And so my output voltage will be two and a half volts. Okay, so we trace this part of the curve still following that curve and then we will keep on tracing that curve when we get to 5 volts so now if this is 5 volts now we start getting to the point where our diode is going to start turning on we're gonna work right 5 volts is equilibrium because we have no voltage across our, our diode yet. Um, but we're going to slowly start turning our diode on as we increase the input voltage beyond 5 volts. Uh, to the point at which our, at, at some point our diode becomes fully conducting. So let's say my input voltage is now that's going to be somewhere about here. Let's say it's 10 volts. Okay. Oops. Okay, so if my input voltage is 10 volts, This point in the circuit is 10 volts. What bias condition do I have on my diode? Uh, I have a higher potential here. I'm going to lose, I'm going to have some voltage drop uh, across that resistor from the current flowing through it. But I'm probably not dropping uh, 5 volts across this resistor. So I probably have a, a higher. Uh, voltage at this point in the circuit than I do at this point in the circuit. So I'm going to have some current flowing through my diode and it'll be forward biased. Now if it's fully forward biased according to our constant voltage drop model I will have about 0.7 volt, volts across there no matter what current is going through. If I have a really big current maybe it'll be a little bit more than 0.7 volts but still, 0.7 volts is a good approximation. Okay, so if that's the case, then what is the voltage at this point in the circuit? From here, 5 volts across this source, plus the 0.7 volts across the diode. So this is 5.7 volts. And that corresponds to this point on our curve. 
even if my input is 10 volts, um, my output voltage is limited to whatever this DC voltage is, plus 0.7 volts when the diode is fully turned on. So the important point becomes 5.7 volts. That's when this whole thing levels off. Okay, any questions on uh, this version of the limiter? Okay. Uh, if not, then we are done talking about diodes. So we are going to move on to our next topic. And now we're going to be talking about amplifiers. And this is a topic that we will stick with for pretty much the rest of the semester. When we talk about transistors, we'll be talking about transistors as amplifiers. We'll talk about using transistors as switches too, but we'll spend more time uh, talking about using a transistor as an amplifier because that's a more complicated uh, application than just a switch. So uh, what we're going to do right now is we're going to first just talk about amplifiers in general. So this can apply to any kind of amplifier. Uh, and then we'll talk about specific types of amplifiers. So the next topic will be uh, operational amplifiers, and then we'll talk about uh, uh, transistors and how transistors can be used as amplifiers. But first, let's go through amplifiers really generally. Okay, so uh, for an amplifier, what's the purpose of the amplifier? Uh, increase the input signal and so uh, what we're doing is we're going to take some small input signal and make it into a larger output signal that is uh, the purpose of an amplifier in our circuits why would we want to do that uh, well an example and you'll be working on this uh, in your lab is uh, an audio amplifier so an audio amplifier we want to uh, power a speaker. So if we look at the block diagram of where this, this, this amplifier fits into an audio system, if you had a radio, um, you're receiving the, the radio waves from the radio station. Uh, and that is a, a low voltage, low current signal it's just coming in uh, over the air. I didn't draw the receiver part here, but once you receive that signal and have it uh, inside your electronics, you need to be able to boost that signal so it can actually you can actually do something useful with it. So once you receive the radio waves, you can amplify the voltage of that signal. Then you usually are going to amplify the current of that signal as well. And then you're going to send it uh, to your speakers. And that's where the amplifiers fit in to the, the block diagram of a radio. Um, this block diagram is a little updated, maybe, because anyone still have a CD player? Only one person? Two people? OK, so let's. Uh, Let's replace this by uh, digital audio file. So when you decode that digital audio file, it's still a low voltage signal. So you need to send that same kind of thing. You send it to an amplifier. This one is going to amplify voltage. Uh, then you have a, a power amplifier. It's called a power amplifier because we're using P equals VI, but really the purpose of this amplifier is to amplify current. And then you send it to your speakers. Why do you need to amplify current before? If you already amplified voltage, why do you need to 
to amplify current before you send it to the speakers. Yes, to in order to make the speaker work. How does the speaker work? It vibrates air, but how do you get the, the speaker to move to vibrate the air? It's an electromagnet. So you have a coil in your speaker, and you have a magnet, and you use magnetic force to produce a, a vibration at whatever frequency your music's at, and that vibration oscillates the air, and you get your audio out of your speaker. But because it's an electromagnet, it uses a lot of current. So just having a high voltage is not good enough. You also need a lot of current. The bigger your speakers, the more current you need. Anyway, so that's why you have, you're not only amplifying voltage, you're amplifying uh, current. And if you, and it's called a power amplifier because if you uh, amplify current here, um, then you're amplifying the power, the total power that you're sending to the speaker as well. Okay, um, so we have some specific requirements that we want our amplifiers to satisfy. The main requirement that we have is that our amplifiers are linear amplifiers. So what that means uh, from a mathematical point of view is um, here's my amplifier um, if I have some input signal into my amplifier the output signal out of that amplifier is going to be that imp input signal multiplied by some factor and we use A here um, as the gain uh, of the amplifier okay so it's the input multiplied just by by some factor which is the gain and that's that's what's the output is going to be so in other words uh, visually if I, I look at the input signal and say it's a sinusoid uh, with a certain frequency the output of my amplifier if I'm just multiplying that sinusoid by a gain factor then what should that sinusoid look like Yeah, same frequency just with a larger amplitude. So this is what you would expect at the output of a linear amplifier. So let's look at uh, a couple more visual examples. So these are my, ampl my linear amplifiers. These are my inputs. Here's another sinusoid. So I get a sinusoid with the same frequency. Um, just a, a bigger amplitude. It applies to other signals as well. So even if I had a, a sawtooth wave, I'm going to get the, the same shape of the wave, same frequency out, just a larger amplitude. Or if I had some arbitrary signal, then it's going to be that same signal, uh, same frequency components, everything. It's just a larger amplitude. And that's what we expect uh, out of our linear amplifiers. So, what's a nonlinear amplifier? Well, if you had, if you looked at the output of your amplifier, and it looks like this, so you have uh, a gain factor times your input signal. This is your linear term. But then I also have a different gain factor multiplied by, say, the square of my input signal and a third gain factor multiplied by the cube of my input input signal. These are my nonlinear terms. Okay, so these terms are going to be outputs at different frequencies uh, from my original input signal. And so this is going to be a nonlinear distortion, and I don't want that in my amplifiers. Because imagine, you can also imagine this, um, if, again, if this is an audio amplifier. Okay, so you put in a, uh, a signal at a certain note, let's say uh, a C note or something like that. Okay, and then you get a, a magnified version of that note, 
But if you had this nonlinear amplification, then you're going to get some sounds out at different, um, different notes. So different frequencies are also going to come out. And you don't expect that to come out of a good amplifier. You only want the original input signal uh, multiplied by whatever gain that is. Okay, so we want to design uh, linear amplifiers. We don't want uh, these nonlinear terms here. Um, these are just the ways that we, we uh, draw the amplifiers. So this is a two-port amplifier, and this is the circuit symbol for it. Um, the triangle is the symbol for the amplifier, and then these lines are just the, the symbols for the input and the output. So I can put, say, some voltage in across the input port and look at some voltage out across the output port. Uh, that's the uh, most general case of an amplifier. Usually you're going to have a common ground between the input and the output. So this is a way to represent that. And if you want to simplify that even further, then you don't even bother drawing the ground. You just assume the input and output have a common ground. And you'll see this symbol uh, quite a lot in schematics where you just have the input and the output. You don't, you don't, you don't bother drawing um, the, um, the complete port and the ground. Okay, so we'll be using these symbols a lot when we talk about amplifiers. Um, let's also look at gain a little bit more carefully. So that gain factor was how much the amplifier is multiplying the, the input signal by. So uh, we can define different types of gain. So one of them would be voltage gain. So I have, if I have uh, an input voltage Vi of t and output voltage uh, V naught of t, and my voltage gain, which is also uh, written as that gain uh, variable A, with a subscript V is just going to be the output voltage divided by the input voltage. Um, I can also have current going into my amplifier and coming out of my amplifier. And so I can use that to define current gain. This will be a capital A with a sub I uh, for current, and it's just the output current divided by the input current. And then I can also define power gain. So since it's power, you can just take the voltage times the current. The voltage gain times the current gain would give you the power gain, or you can do it knowing the output uh, voltage and current divided by the input voltage and current. Okay, so for each amplifier, or for any amplifier, we can describe these quantities. It's voltage gain, it's current gain, and it's power gain. Um, as long as we know what the, the relationship is between the input and output. And we can also uh, graphically uh, represent any one of these gains. And that's with uh, the transfer characteristic. So that's plotting the output voltage as a function of input voltage. Um, and since these are linear amplifiers, it should be a line. And the slope, since I'm plotting voltages here, the slope of this line should be equal to the voltage gain. If I plot uh, current instead, then the slope of this line would be the current gain. Any questions so far?
Okay, one other uh, terminology that we have to learn when we talk about gain uh, is something called decibels. And that is uh, um, shortened to a lowercase d and a capital B. And this is a unit that is used to describe gain. Now, gain itself is, is unitless because I'm always taking some uh, uh, quantity, like voltage, and dividing by the same one. So it's volts divided by volts, so, so the gain is unitless. But once I convert it to decibels, it now has units again. Um, and the way that you do that is you take, if it's voltage or current gain, you're going to take the log of whatever that, that um, gain factor was and multiply that by 20. And that will give you the voltage or current gain in dB. If it's power gain, it's only 10 times the log of the power gain factor because I just did voltage times current together. And that will give me the gain in dB. Um, what happens if I have negative dB? That means my, my log was negative. That means something's less than 1. What's less than 1? The argument of the log is less than 1. OK, so what does that, what does that mean about my amplifier? Yes. So negative dB means uh, I don't have any gain. I'm actually, my, my output signal is less than my input signal. So this is called attenuation. So my output signal. So if you design an amplifier and you calculate the gain in dB and it's negative, and something's wrong there. Something or you need to change something in your circuit because then it's not amplifying anymore. Okay, let's look at um, just some quick examples. Okay, so let's say that this is a, a power amplifier. So my power in is a milliwatt. My power gain is 100. So what's my uh, output power going to be? How do I figure out the output? So power gain is defined as the power at the output divided at the power at the input. So how do I figure out the power at the output? Something times gain. What times gain? So I'll just do some algebra here. So the input power times my power gain is my output power. So 1 milliwatt times 100. So 100 milliwatts. Okay, now let's convert this power gain to dB. So we have to use 10 times the log uh, of the gain because it's power. So what's... Uh, 10 times the log of 100. What's the log of 100? 2. This is 2. So 10 times 2. So this is 20 dB. So if I wanted to represent the power gain, instead of writing 100, I could also write that the power gain is 20 dB, either representation.
It's fine. Any questions on this? Is this okay? Okay. So somehow I put in a milliwatt of power into the input of my amplifier and I got out a hundred milliwatts. So how do I how did I get more power at the output than I had at the input? How is that possible? Okay, so the amplifier I'm adding power to the amplifier in order to uh, get more power at the output than I am at the input. And that's that's not shown in this diagram. But that is shown in this diagram. Okay, so this is a more complete uh, schematic of uh, your amplifier. So these connections here, this V plus and this V minus, are DC power supplies. And so you're going to be supplying some DC power at some voltage, and then you'll have some current uh, going into your amplifier. And that is the, um, the power that you're putting into the amplifier so that you can get a larger uh, power out than you had a power in. Okay, so for this particular example, I'm supplying a positive voltage V1 and a current into my amplifier I1 and a negative voltage V2, which means the, the amplifier sources a current I2. So if I want to look at that, the total DC power that the amplifier is using, it's going to be V1 times I1 uh, plus V2 times I2. And then if I look at the, um, the power balance for this circuit, the things I'm putting into the amplifier would be the power at this input plus the DC power. Those are the powers that I'm uh, giving to the, the amplifier. And what the amplifier is producing is the power to the load. And the amplifier is, is probably dissipating some power in its uh, internal circuitry. Okay, so that's going to balance out. So I, I'm, I'm contributing some DC power to the amplifier. I have some power from the input signal, and then I produce some power of my output signal that goes to some load, and then I, I waste some power uh, within the amplifier itself. And that should all sum up to zero. Or I mean, it, the, the both sides are going to equal uh, one another. Okay, so I can define an amplifier efficiency, which is just going to be the, the amount of power that I can deliver to the load divided by the amount of power that I supplied to the amplifier and, and multiply that by 100%. Uh, this efficiency calculation um, is neglecting the contribution of the input power, but that's fine because the input power should be small, otherwise we don't, didn't have to amplify it. So the input power should be small compared to all the other um, terms in, in this equation here. Okay, so your amplifier is going to have uh, some finite efficiency to it, meaning that there's some amount of power um, that it's that the amplifier itself is using up, and it's just wasted as heat. Of course, you want to get the efficiency as high as possible. That means that that this wasted power is, is as low as possible. But that's a, a specification that you'll have for, for each amplifier. Um, let's now look at the amplifier output again. And so this is um, the, that transfer characteristic that we looked at before, except it's extended out a little bit farther. Okay, so previously we said we were looking at this part of the transfer characteristic. Uh, the y-axis is output voltage, 
the x-axis is input voltage. And we said that for a linear amplifier, we're just going to have a line and it'll have a slope that's equal to, since this is voltage, the slope is equal to the voltage gain. Okay, but we ignored what happens if we uh, try to make the output of the amplifier too large. So what's going to happen uh, to our amplifier is if we try to make it output a signal that's too large for the amplifier to handle, it's just, it's not going to do it. Um, it's going to behave sort of like the, the limiter uh, kind of circuit. So we can figure out what this is going to be because uh, our transfer characteristic here, this, this line with this slope of AV uh, is going to have uh, some upper limit, that's this line here, and some lower limit, that's this line here. And these upper limits and lower limits are going to be approximately equal to the DC voltage that you're supplying to your amplifier. So remember our amplifier in the previous uh, slide. We were su supplying this with some uh, positive voltage and some negative voltage. <clears throat> so this uh, upper voltage limit is going to be approximately equal to whatever positive voltage we're supplying to our amplifier. And the negative limit is going to be approximately equal to the negative voltage that we supply to our amplifier. Now, if I put an input signal into my amplifier, I can figure out what's going to happen at the output using this transfer characteristic. Okay, so let's look at this input signal in the beginning, the one I just traced uh, with the red line. Okay, so my input signal is going to be uh, some sinusoidal signal that's varying between some voltage level. Uh, we can call this one volt and negative one volt maybe. Okay, and to figure out what the output of my amplifier will be, I just have to uh, draw a vertical line that corresponds to my maximum input voltage, see where that intersects the uh, transfer characteristic, and let's draw a horizontal line from that point. And same thing with the negative side of my input voltage. Draw that line up until I intersect the transfer characteristic and then draw a horizontal line uh, out to the right. Okay, so this curve that I'm now tracing in red corresponds to what my output will look like for this given input. And you can see it's a little bit bigger or it's bigger than my input a voltage because I just uh, amplified the output by a factor equal to the slope of this transfer characteristic. Okay, and this one is is um, a linear amplification of my input signal because it's has the same frequency, same shape. Uh, it just is a uh, um, has a, a larger peak-to-peak uh, -peak voltage. Now let's look at the second case. Okay, I'm going to keep the gain the same of my amplifier, so the slope is going to stay the same, but I'm just going to put in a, a, a much bigger input voltage. Okay, so that's going to be this curve that I'm tracing with the dashed red. Okay, so if I try to extend this peak voltage up, this is supposed to be a straight line. You can see I'm off of that, the transfer characteristic. I'm off of that, that linear curve. So uh, the best I can do, the best I can amplify is actually um, at the edge of my, uh, my finite slope curve and extend that down to here and extend that down to here. So that's the best I can do at the output. So that means that with this input signal, 
uh, this this number two input signal my amplifier is going to go the output of my amplifier oops is going to go up and it theoretically it should uh, go out even further but my amplifier cannot output a voltage that high so what's going to happen is that the signal is just going to become flat it's going to hit a limit um, which is the limit of the output voltage of the amplifier then when my input signal becomes smaller it'll go back down down to here it can't go negative enough so when my input signal is too negative my output will just hit a negative limit and then it'll go back okay so this output waveform might be hard to see on this graph but my output is going to look something like this where I'm kind of cutting the peaks off the, um, the sinusoidal signal at the output so this signal does not look like what my input signal looked like it's not a sinusoid anymore okay so uh, there is some distortion going on and that is due to an effect called saturation. I tried to, uh, or my, my amplifier is supposed to have a signal that's larger than what it can actually output. So at, at these points, the output saturated. It got to its maximum output voltage and it couldn't go any higher. It got to its ne me, um, smallest negative voltage and it couldn't go any lower. So the output is saturated. And that's something you want to avoid um, when you use your amplifier. Either you want to have an amplifier with a larger output voltage swing, or you need to restrict your input voltages uh, to something smaller. Because this is, this is um, going to be distortion at your output. Okay, so this is an example of a, a transfer characteristic of an amplifier. Um, but usually this is not what you're going to see. Um, if you look at a more typical device, this is going to be a transfer characteristic where um, I don't get a, a linear slope until after my input voltage has increased uh, quite a bit. Um, and then I'm going to saturate again. So if I did the same thing and I put some small input signal um, varying from, let's say, again, let's say this is one volt to negative one volt. I'm intersecting this part of the transfer curve where there's no slope to it, so there's no gain. And so I'm not going to get any output at all on this amplifier. I have this section over here where I do have some slope that correspond to some voltage gain but I can't get there um, with this with this input signal so my amplifier is not working to amplify this input signal and this is what will happen a lot um, in a real amplifier for example this could be a, a, a transfer characteristic of uh, a transistor but we can use transistors ampl as amplifiers so uh, what we need to do is uh, we need to do something called biasing. Oh, sorry, before, before I talk about biasing, another way to try to get ampl amplification out of this is I just put a really big input signal in um, so that part of my input signal starts to intersect the part of the curve that has some amplification. But then if I do that, that graphical approach and take the maximum point of my input, see where it intersects the curve, extend that out uh, horizontally. Then I need to take this point at the curve, which is the, the minimum output voltage that I can have, and extend that out. So I'm only amplifying this part of my input signal. And so my output just looks like this. I'm missing all of this information in my input signal. So this, my input signal was a sinusoid. My output definitely doesn't look like a sinusoid. 
So I'm, I'm getting distortion uh, here as well. This is not linear amplification. So in order to get linear amplification out of this amplifier, I need to do something called biasing. And what biasing is going to do is it's going to allow the input signal uh, to hit the part of the transfer characteristic where I have that nice uh, linear slope so I can get that linear amplification. Okay, so to do that, all I have to do is add a DC component to my input signal. So if my input signal now is not centered about zero, but is centered about this DC voltage of VI, and let's say I have my, my time varying input, now it looks like this. Now when I draw my line from the maximum uh, input voltage, it intersects the linear part of the curve, and I go out to the right. Same thing with the minimum uh, input voltage. It still intersects uh, the linear part of the curve go out to the right. So this is going to be my output signal, an amplified version of my input with no distortion. Okay, so I needed to add some DC um, at the input in order to shift where my input signal was intersecting with this transfer characteristic. So how you physically do that is if I have my amplifier and this amplifier has this transfer characteristic. Here's my input signal. And I just added this DC source, which is equal to the value of this DC point right here. So this is going to be my DC bias. So it allows me to then amplify uh, some time varying signal linearly even though my transfer characteristic uh, was shifted towards the right okay and we're going to look at at this idea uh, a lot when we talk about uh, transistor amplifiers because like I said for transistors we're going to have this kind of curve a lot where we need to add some bias to it so that we're operating uh, in the right area. Okay, one quick question before we end today. So what if my transfer characteristic looks like this? What's my gain now? Yeah, so in this case, I have a negative gain. So does that mean I'm attenuating the signal? No. What does it mean? I'm flipping it. Uh, can we put that into terms that we used in 2.13 or 2.11? Uh, inverting it. Um, so what does that mean about the phase of the signal? So this, uh, the output of my amplifier is directly out of phase uh, with the input of my amplifier, or I'm inverting the signal. I'm still getting gain out of it, but I just have a phase difference now between my output and my input. Okay, that's it for today. Thank <laughs> you.